Hello, everyone. On behalf of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, a warm welcome to all of you. Special thanks to Dr. Loneal for volunteering his time and expertise with us today. We have over 2,400 people participating in today's program from across the United States, as well as other countries, including Canada, Colombia, Egypt, France, Indonesia, Ireland, and the United Kingdom. We would like to acknowledge and thank Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech, and Biogen, J GSK, Janssen Oncology and Legend Biotech, and Cario Farm Therapeutics for their support for today's program. Following the presentation, we will take questions from the audience. We are also taping and transcribing this program for future posting on our website. At any time during the presentation, you can adjust the slide window to full screen by clicking the square icon at the top right corner of each box. To exit full screen mode, you can click the small square at the top right corner of the enlarged window. Closed captioning is available for this program and is located below the video player and is viewable by clicking the closed captioning tab. A closed caption window will then appear below the presentation. The Leukemia and Lymphoma Society exists to find cures and ensure access to treatment for blood cancer patients. To advance this mission, LLS's Office of Public Policy supports a policy agenda aimed at accelerating the development of new treatments for cancer and breaking down the barriers to care that patients often encounter. You may want to become active in LLS's advocacy efforts to ensure that myeloma patients get the access to quality, affordable, and coordinated care, or to share your story to inspire a legislator and help them understand your experience by visiting lls.org forward slash advocacy. I'm now pleased to introduce Dr. Sigar Loneal, Professor and Chair in the Department of Hematology and Medical Oncology, Chief Medical Officer at the Winship Cancer Institute of Emory University, as well as the Anne and Bernard Gray Family Chair in Cancer at Emory University School of Med Medicine. Dr. Loneal, I'm now privileged to turn the program over to you. Thank you very much, and I appreciate everybody taking time out of their day to join us today for this, uh, what I hope will be a very informational um, session for you all. And really what I wanted to do, um, you know, with the next uh, 30 or 40 minutes was give you an insight into some of the really exciting areas of development of myeloma. I know many of you all are aware of the new drug that just received accelerated approval yesterday, teclistumab. I've got just a couple slides on that already built into the program, potentially anticipating that approval, but also um, uh, wanted to show you the breadth and depth of what we're doing in myeloma research that really has changed the natural history of this disease over time. And so to get started, uh, what I really wanna begin with is an idea for hopefully all of you about where we are in uh, 2022. And um, while um, I will often talk about this slide, this is the RBD 1000 series that was published by our group. Um, the reality is that while this is an expectation for where we hope our patients will be in 2022, the reality is that it's probably even better. And the reason I say that is these are progression-free and overall survival curves for a thousand consecutively treated patients at Emory that goes back to about 2009, 2010. Uh, and what you'll see is that the median duration of first remission for those patients is uh, five and a half years, and the median overall survival is over 10 years. Uh, now, we did update this data more recently at ASCO, and the median survival has gotten better. The median progression-free survival has improved with longer follow-up as well. But I think it really sets a benchmark for what the expectations both from physicians and patients should be for what a myeloma patient's journey should be using drugs that were available 10 years ago, recognizing that we now have drugs like anti-CD38 antibodies, we have second and third generation uh, immunomodulatory drugs, we now have CAR-Ts and biospecifics, 
and that likely these curves are even better today than they were based on patients' treatment from eight to 10 years ago. Uh, and so uh, I am hopeful that the next time we update this data uh, in the next five years, the curves will continue to improve, demonstrating that hopefully there is an even larger fraction of patients that are potentially cured of their disease with the kinds of drugs that we have available in 2022 and beyond. So I'm gonna really cover three topics uh, in the talk. I'm gonna talk about immune therapy and targets and we'll focus a little bit on antibodies, uh, bispecifics and CAR T cells. I then wanna tell a story in precision medicine and myeloma because that's something that I think is spread beyond uh, uh, in all of cancer. Precision medicine is a big buzzword that people are using and it's been much more limited in its efficacy in myeloma. And then finally talk about new versions of existing agents that are likely even better uh, than the current compounds that we have and how they may make an impact on the treatment paradigm as well. So let's start off talking about what I guess you could argue in 2020 or 2021 was the molecule of the year in myeloma, and that's BCMA. And we know that BCMA, also known as B cell maturation antigen, or BCMA for short, is a really important receptor on the surface of myeloma cells. And so not only does it serve as an important target for things like CAR T cells at the top of the cartoon, uh, or bispecific antibodies in the middle uh, right of the cartoon, or antibody drug conjugates that you'll see at the bottom. And we're gonna talk about each of those briefly. But BCMA also is responsible uh, for many of the important things that malignant plasma cells do to stay alive. And so by blocking signaling through BCMA, you may ultimately make it harder for that myeloma cell to stay alive, that ultimately will uh, make it more susceptible to the therapy that we're using. So BCMA is an important therapeutic target because we have uh, antibodies and things to go after it, but it's also an important drug resistance and myeloma cell proliferation target. And so we sort of get a two for one in many ways if we target BCMA. It's also important to recognize uh, that um, there are, and we're gonna talk about this later on, there are enzymes that cleave and remove BCMA from the surface of the myeloma cell and release it into the plasma. And there are in fact strategies now trying to prevent that cleavage that may actually make the treatments more effective. So the first drug that was approved targeting BCMA is an antibody drug conjugate. This is belantamab mafodotin, also known as Belamaf. Uh, Belamaf is an antibody drug conjugate, meaning that there's a piece of chemotherapy hooked onto the back of that antibody. So when it binds BCMA, that piece of chemotherapy then gets internalized. And in the context of refractory myeloma, about one in three patients will have a response. And for the patients who do respond, that response can often land, last up to a year. Now, there are some unique adverse events associated with Belamaf, the most important being ocular toxicity or keratopathy. There are some very practical things that one can do to try and minimize that. And this does require a partnership and team approach, uh, not just on the, on the oncology side, but also partnering closely with ophthalmology. And most of the large practices have set this up where we are set up to partner with an eye doctor or an eye care specialist to help deliver this drug when it is the right uh, treatment for a given patient. Now, the other uh, uh, thing that we have that targets uh, uh, BCMA that everybody's very excited about are CAR T cells. And just to give you a little bit of a primer in basic biology, uh, uh, what a CAR T cell really does is it has a binding domain on the inside of a T cell. There is also what's called the co-stimulatory domain. And CAR T cells have been used with great success in diseases like ALL, or in large cell lymphoma, or even in CLL, uh, and are now being tested in a number of different blood cancers with the idea that you can change this tumor antigen binding domain at the, si at the top to whatever you want. And so what ends up happening is you create a T cell that has that specific binding domain. And in the case of myeloma right now, it's BCMA, 
You then engineer those cells and give it back to the patient. And then the T cells that have been engineered to target BCMA go after any cell that expresses BCMA. So that is right now the two FDA approved treatments that are CAR T cells in myeloma really target BCMA through this uh, binding domain that is induced by a viral vector uh, uh, against a patient's own uh, T cells. So it's using their own T cells to do this. And so the process from a logistics perspective is that a patient undergoes leukapheresis. And leukapheresis is a fancy way of saying we filter out the blood to collect the T cells. Now, those of you who have had apheresis to collect a stem cell graft this is the same concept, only there is no growth factor administration. We just want whatever's in the blood, and then we use that to, uh, those cells are then isolated at the manufacturing site. They are then transduced with a viral vector that then causes those T cells that came from the patient. So this is a patient-specific treatment to express a, a, a binding domain that targets, in this case, BCMA. You then expand those CAR T cells in vitro, and then you give it back to the patient. So you give them back their own T cells after they've received a little bit of chemotherapy to allow that T cell to be accepted, and then you wait for the activity. So we'll talk about that uh, uh, as we go forward as well. But this is sort of the cliff notes, if you will, on CAR T cell manufacturing and administration for a given patient with multiple myeloma. Now, the first trial that led to the FDA approval of a CAR T cell in myeloma was the KARMA trial. And the KARMA trial used uh, a product or a vector that we now called IDACEL. And IDACEL is just a, a binding domain and a vector uh, that was used here, again, that binds BCMA, uh, uses, uh, again, the co-stimulatory domains are listed here. These are not huge, important details from a patient perspective. What's really important is that the target of those CAR T cells was BCMA. And one of the things that we know about this early phase trial is that we gave different doses of the CAR. In some patients, we gave 150 million. In some patients, we gave 300 million. And in other patients, we gave 450 million cells. And if you begin to look at the overall response rate, remember, this is a median of five to six prior lines of therapy. So very heavily pretreated patients. And what you'll see here is that the overall response rate does vary based on the dose. And on average, it was about 73% across the board. And this really was unprecedented when we talk about response rates in the context of triple class and generally refractory myeloma in general. So very encouraging data across the board. Now, the other CAR T-cell product that was uh, out there is Siltacel, uh, which uh, uh, is a different product. It's got a different vector. It actually binds BCMA in two different places. So structurally, it's a little bit different. And the dosing of Siltacel was different. They got doses as low as 0.51 million cells all the way up to almost 1 million cells. And so based on those differences in dosing, what we see is a slight difference in side effects. The cytokine release syndrome that one is going to see occurs sooner with Idacel than it does with Siltacel. With Idacel, it tends to occur within the first 24 to 48 hours after infusion. With Siltacel, it tends to occur about a week after infusion because those cells are growing in vivo. In the patient, those cells are continuing to grow up. And just as an example, the overall response rate for Siltacel was almost 98%. And if you look at remission duration, it's over two and a half years here. And again, the remission duration varies based on how deep the response was. The deeper the response, the longer the remission duration appears to be. Now, this in Siltacel is to be contrasted in Idacel with a median remission duration of about a year. Uh, although, um, again, uh, whether these products are appreciably different, I think is, is currently a, an area for some discussion and debate. But certainly on the surface, it, it appears that the Siltacel remission duration appears to be longer than what we see with Idacel overall. 
Now, as good as those two products are, and I think we're certainly happy with the response rates, what we have not seen is a plateau on a curve that suggests that some patients are ultimately cured of their myeloma. And that may be a function of the fact that we're treating very, very late and resistant patients, but it also may be a function of the fact that many of these patients that we're treating, the CAR T cells don't last long enough or there are residual cells that somehow escape the treatment and death induced by uh, a CAR T cell. And so we're trying to make CAR T cells better. And this is an example of a trial that's being run through Novartis using a product where instead of three to four weeks for manufacturing, which is what both Idacel and Siltacel require, with this compound, it's 48 hours. So you don't have to worry about what's happening to the myeloma after you collect those T cells. 48 hours later, you're ready to give the CAR T cell product back. And what we've seen in early, very early preliminary data is that the response rates are equally as high. What we don't know right now is whether the duration of response will be longer. But certainly it appears on the surface that we're getting a slightly different T cell population that may portend for a better long-term remission, at least using in vitro studies. So this is one way where we're trying to improve on the efficacy of a CAR T cell to really get to that plateau phase and ultimately tell patients they are in fact cured of their myeloma and don't require additional therapy. Now, another way to try and enhance the efficacy of a CAR T cell is to use something called a gamma secretase inhibitor. And a gamma secretase, as you recall from a few slides ago, is the scissors here. It's the enzyme that removes BCMA from the surface of plasma cells and puts it into the serum. And when it's in the serum, it can sort of distract, if you will, from whatever strategy you're using to target uh, a BCMA by binding up, whether it's a CAR T cell, or an antibody drug conjugate or a bispecific antibody. It serves as a sink, if you will, to take away effective drug from the tumor cell and allow it to just float freely in the serum because it's bound to that serum or soluble BCMA. <clears throat> now, as you can imagine, that is suboptimal. And so there are actually studies, uh, one done by our colleagues out in the West Coast at the Hutch, giving a CAR T cell where they use a gamma secretase inhibitor to try and increase expression of BCMA and see whether they can overcome resistance or get better responses. And at least in early preliminary data, the answer may in fact be yes to that question. It's also being combined with Belomaf or Belantamab mafodotin to also reduce uh, the amount of Belomaf you need, perhaps reducing that ocular toxicity but maintaining the same level of efficacy by giving a lower dose of Belomap. So this is something you're gonna see in the future as well to generally improve the efficacy of anything that targets BCMA. Now, again, we've talked about BCMA and this is really important data from a CAR T cell perspective, looking at another target for CAR T cells. And these are CAR T cells that target GPRC5D. And if that's a mouthful for you to say, the actual name is even much longer than that. So just focus on GPRC5D. And the reality is that GPRC5D is yet another target on the surface of myeloma cells. And so the group at Memorial Sloan Kettering actually did a phase one study of a CAR T cell targeting GPRC5D. This was actually very recently published in the New England Journal just in the last month. And what they demonstrated was very uh, encouraging activity in that phase one trial, and the safety appeared to be similar to what we see for a BCMA-directed CAR T cell. So one of the questions that I'm sure is gonna come up in the discussion today is, well, I've had a BCMA-directed CAR T and my myeloma came back, what else can I do? This is one potential option that you could do is have another CAR T or potentially another treatment that targets this different antigen called GPRC5D uh, if BCMA targeting is no longer an option for you uh, as a patient. So just trying to show you some of the really exciting data and opportunities that we have coming in the near future. 
Now, we've talked about CAR T cells and antibody drug conjugates. I also want to talk about what is probably the biggest news in the myeloma world in the last 48 hours, and that's bispecific T cell engagers. And this is basically like giving a monoclonal antibody, except that it takes a, it, ta it makes the antibody look different. So if you'll see the blue antibody on the left has two portions, the left and the right portion of the Y, both bind CD3. That's a T cell antibody. On the right side, you'll see that orange and yellow one where both sides bind BCMA. That's a typical monoclonal antibody. What we do in a bispecific is take one part of the antibody and have it bind CD3, which binds T cells, and the other half binds BCMA. So you're basically bringing the two antibodies together into a new bispecific antibody and what that does then is bring a T cell right next to a cell that expresses, in this case, BCMA. And what that does is activate that T cell and bring it physically close to the myeloma cell so that it can then kill the myeloma cell by activation. So many ways, this is like having a CAR T cell without having to take the cells out of the body. You basically use an antibody to activate and bring that T cell next to the myeloma cell. And the antibody or the bispecific that was approved yesterday is teclistimab. This is a BCMA CD3 bispecific antibody. Again, it's got a portion of a BCMA, a portion of a CD3, and you put it together and you get this part that the blue part binds a T cell, the green part binds a myeloma cell, and together it induces cell death. And so you can see that very nicely illustrated in the cartoon here in terms of its potential. And what I think is really quite exciting, and as you saw from the FDA approval yesterday, is that it can be highly effective. And in fact, if you begin to look at overall responses in this, uh, in this, uh, with this target, uh, this is the Majestic 1 trial, looking at teclistimab, it's over 60%. If you look at responses, even among patients who've had prior BCMA-directed therapy, whether it's a CAR T cell, or an antibody drug conjugate, the response rate is over 50%, and it looks like the remission duration in all patients lasts about a year. Uh, so, and again, that's in a very heavily pretreated group of patients. That data was published in the New England Journal earlier in the summer, and I think is very encouraging data and ultimately led to the FDA approval of teclistimab in myeloma. Now, not to be left out, there are probably five or six other BCMA-directed bispecifics that are in middle to late stage development. Uh, some of these include agents like l from Pfizer down here at the bottom, again, showing an overall response rate of about 80%. Uh, there's another one, the TNB3838, that shows a response rate of about 80%. There's a Regeneron compound that's got a response rate of about 62% uh, and others that are in the development and in the works right now as well. And this to me is a really exciting avenue of uh, investigation because each of these bispecifics is slightly different. Some are IV, some are subcutaneous, some are dosed once a week, some are dosed every other week, some are dosed every three weeks. They're all slight, slightly different, subtle differences between these that I think will ultimately help us to identify what's the best approach for targeting BCMA with a bispecific uh, uh, in the context of a patient with multiple myeloma. Now, um, there are other targets, however, that I think are extremely important in myeloma. And we've talked about one of them already, that's GPRC5D. This is data from the monumental trial using telketamab this is another bispecific. This bispecific targets GPRC5D. So the CAR T cell that I showed you earlier, uh, this one targets uh, something, uh, the same target, GPRC5D. And as you can see, this agent is given subcutaneously. Um, there are some specifics about these bispecifics that I think are really important, and we can talk about them in the Q&A. Uh, but I think in general, what you're seeing here is an idea uh, that these bispecific antibodies are being tested in a very resistant patient population. And if you begin to look at response rates, what you'll see here is 70 and 63% overall response rate in refractory myeloma. So median again of five to six prior lines of therapy, 
uh, and that this is yet another new immune target that we have to go after in the context of multiple myeloma. Now, I'm going to confuse you even further by showing you yet another immune target that has a bispecific that's targeting it. And this is an agent called Sevastimab. Sevastimab binds a protein called FCRH5. And FCRH5 is also present on all plasma cells. So we've talked about BCMA. We've talked about GPRC5D. This is FCRH5. And this is also a bispecific T cell engager. It binds both CD3 on a T cell and FCRH5 on a plasma cell. And this again was a very resistant patient population. Their myeloma was very resistant, median of six prior lines of therapy. Almost all were resistant to their most recent treatment. And what you're seeing here is an overall response rate of almost 60% at the higher dose level. Uh, and uh, again, the adverse events are really no different than what we've seen with BCMA or GPRC5D targeting. GPRC5D may have a slightly different adverse event profile that is worth us probably talking about in Q&A, but in general, the main adverse events are cytokine release syndrome and neurologic toxicity, and happy to talk through that again during uh, the Q&A that's going to follow this uh, session. So lots of immune targets, lots of immune therapies. This to me is an incredibly exciting area, era and area in the context of myeloma research. Now, I'm going to spend a little time talking about precision medicine and myeloma, and I want to talk about this because this is an emerging area, particularly in a genetic subset of patients. And the subset I'm going to really focus on is the 1114 translocated myeloma patients. And I'm going to really make a pitch that that is our first example of precision medicine in myeloma. And what you see here on the right side of this screen is a series of myeloma cell lines. And other than the purple one, you don't see much cell death with a drug called ABT199, which is also known as venetoclax. You can see it in the title of the slide. Venetoclax doesn't work in most myeloma cell lines. It does, however, work in a few. And those few are what we call BCL2 dependent or have the 1114 translocation. And what we showed uh, in a series of, uh, uh, of in vitro studies was that there are, in fact, some patients who were exquisitely sensitive to venetoclax in myeloma. And what was most common about those patients on the right side is that they expressed the 1114 translocation. And in fact, the second most sensitive patient that we've ever treated is this patient that you see here in the right with the, uh, the, uh, uh, the M protein very rapidly going to zero. This was a patient that had over a five-year remission with single-agent venetoclax after being told that they had refractory myeloma uh, and uh, didn't have other treatment options really to manage. So this can be a highly effective treatment in the right patients. And in fact, what we're also beginning to understand from a biologic perspective is that African-American patients who have the 1114 translocation may actually be more sensitive to venetoclax than their Caucasian counterparts who also harbor the 1114 translocation. And what you're seeing here is that the, uh, uh, the IC50, meaning that the sensitivity of the drug is actually better for the African-American patients than it is for the non-African-American patients, suggesting that they may actually be more sensitive. This is work that we're doing at our center. This is a preliminary data, but we are actually hoping that this will uh, be tested in a clinical trial that we're doing at our center, uh, testing a combination of venetoclax with another drug uh, in this patient population. Yeah, uh, now, even more importantly, when you start to treat myeloma patients with venetoclax, what you begin to see is that if you look at patients who are not 1114 positive, you see a very low overall response rate. When you look only at the 1114 in a phase one study, you see about a 40% response rate. And in fact, when you look at all patients in aggregate, both the positive and the negative, the response rate's about 21%. But this led our group to say, maybe we should be treating more people uh, uh, with 1114 translocation. And so we did that. And what we actually demonstrated was that if you use venetoclax and dexamethasone only in 1114, the response rate is 60% 
in the phase one portion, and it was 50% in the phase two portion. Now, remember, these are resistant myeloma patients, median of five prior lines of therapy, 50% overall response rate with venetoclax and dexamethasone only in the 1114 subset. Now, if you take this one step further and say, well, let's do a larger randomized phase three trial to understand whether or not this can be effective, that's a good idea only if you believe in precision medicine. And as an example, there was a trial done uh, in the US and around the world called the Bellini trial that suggested that uh, if you use uh, venetoclax in, in all patients, uh, that you do see an improvement in remission duration, but you actually see a worsening in overall survival. The reason? This was not using the biomarker, the precision medicine approach that we recommended. If you look at the 1114 in the top curves here, you see a huge difference in remission duration and, in fact, a, a, a no decrement in overall survival. And so this to me is an important lesson that if you're gonna believe in precision medicine, test your trials in precision medicine, because if you test it in everybody, you may not see that biomarker driving responses. And to me, the 1114 subset is a perfect biomarker for identifying who are gonna be most sensitive to venetoclax-based therapy. And so Vikas Gupta from our group actually published a year or so ago, sort of a model saying that most myelomas are MCL1 dependent. They are very proteasome and IMID sensitive, but there are a subset of patients that are more BCL2 dependent. They are less sensitive to proteasome inhibitors and IMIDs and very sensitive for the most part to venetoclax-based therapy. And this to me is the lesson of precision medicine. Now, the last story I'm gonna tell is about taking old targets and making them better. We know that the IMIDs, lenalidomide and pomalidomide, and previous to that, thalidomide, were highly effective drugs in the management of patients with relapsed and refractory myeloma, and are so effective that they got moved all the way to earlier lines of therapy because they really did work quite well. But what we learned most recently is that you could further engineer the structures of lenalidomide and pomalidomide to really try and take advantage of their immune side effects, their immune, uh, not side effects, but immune properties. And that led to the new two new drugs that we're gonna talk about, which are called cell mods. Cell mods because they really do modulate cellular immunity probably more effectively than lenalidomide or pomalidomide did. And the first drug we're gonna talk about is ibertamide, also known as CC220. And the second is a drug called CC92480, now known as mesigdamide or mezi. So Iber and mezi are the two newest cell mods on the block. And I presented this data and we actually recently published data uh, on ibertamide in relapsed and refractory myeloma. And what we showed is that when you combine it with dexamethasone, you get about a 30% response rate in heavily resistant multiple myeloma. But for a patient, the reason that I have this table listed here is if you look at the grade three, grade four, non-blood-related adverse events, what you'll see here is that there are lots of zeros and ones. And what that tells me and what my patients who've received this drug tell me is that this drug is much better tolerated than lenalidomide or pomalidomide, which were the precursors of these drugs in the IMID class. And in fact, I've had a couple of patients now that have said to me, you told me I wasn't on a placebo, I was getting the drug, and yet I can't tell that I'm on the drug. Uh, are you sure that I'm really getting something that's active? And I think this reduction in grade three, grade four adverse events really speaks to the efficacy of this drug and the safety of this drug overall. Now, what we published most recently in Lancet Hematology was this cohort D of patients. These are over 100 patients who received ibertamide at the normal dose, as well as dexamethasone, with a median of at least five prior lines of therapy. And what we showed was that it had about a 26% response rate. But even uh, more interestingly, if we look at patients that were BCMA treated, so the newest class of drugs in the refractory setting, these patients had all seen BCMA-directed therapy, the overall response rate for Iberdex was about 25%. So we had clear activity even in patients 
who were resistant to Iberta, uh, to BCMA directed therapy. So that to me is very encouraging data. And of course, when it works alone in myeloma, our job is to put it together with all the other commonly used myeloma drugs. And so we combined it with daratumumab, we combined it with bortezomib, and we combined it with carfilzomib. And what I think you're seeing here are very encouraging response rates in a phase one study, suggesting that ibertamide is very easy to combine with other commonly used uh, myeloma agents. And because it's more potent and has a better adverse event profile, meaning fewer side effects, it might make a better partner drug than either lenalidomide or pomalidomide in earlier lines of therapy. Now, the last new drug that I'm gonna talk about is CC92480, also known as mesigdomide. Again, structurally very different from lenalidomide and pomalidomide. And in fact, what we know is that both Iber and Mezi are able to activate T cells and activate NK cells much more effectively than lenalidomide or pomalidomide. So these drugs, in my mind, make perfect partners uh, with many of the immune therapies that we've already talked about today. Now, if you look at MEZI uh, in a phase one trial, you'll see the overall response rate in all patients was about 21%. If you look at the recommended phase two dose, the response rate was about 54%. And again, what you're seeing, slightly more blood uh, uh, issues, so neutropenia and thrombocytopenia occurring a little bit more frequently with MEZI than we saw with ibertamide. But again, some of those other imid-associated side effects like diarrhea, constipation, fatigue, uh, those seem to be occurring less frequently with the newly minted uh, cell mod class of drugs, which I think is really exciting. And again, another unique facet, what we know about the cell mod, uh, the IMID class in general, is that they're not as effective in patients with extramedullary disease. And what you're seeing here is the slide of a patient with a large plasma cytoma in the liver who got uh, only CC92480 or MEZI in combination with dexamethasone. And after three cycles of therapy, this patient's liver plasma cytoma had melted away. And we know that patients with extramedullary disease represent a particular and peculiar challenge with modern therapy. And this suggests that MEZI might be a good agent to help manage some of those patients across the board. So to summarize sort of the lecture portion, I guess, if you will, new targets and modalities, including CAR T-cells, T-cell engagers, also known as bispecifics, and antibody drug conjugates have really brought together the immune portion of what we do. And in my mind, we have the potential to eliminate the malignant clone across the board. Um, these trials are testing combinations, again, that rely not only on immune targets, but also existing targets like PIs, IMIDs, corticosteroids, and anti-CD38 monoclonal antibodies. Uh, and precision medicine uh, currently is a reality, and I would argue it's there in the context of the 1114 translocated patients. There are other mutations that we're testing in a couple of trials now, particularly BRAF, IDH1, and MEK mutations, uh, or RAS mutations. Those are being tested with targeted agents as well. But I think the era of understanding the biology of a specific mutation and using it to target in combination with immune therapies is here today. And I think we have to make sure we pay good attention to those because they can be really important tools to join in our battle against myeloma with drugs like proteasome inhibitors, IMIDs, steroids, anti-CD38s, CAR T-cells, T-cell engagers, and antibody drug conjugates ultimately uh, to uh, uh, eliminate the clone and lead to a larger fraction of patients being cured of myeloma. So with that, I think I will stop. This is my group. And again, we're very appreciative uh, for all the patients, all the sponsors, all the partners in our research, including the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society who support our, um, our SCORE grant that we work with very closely with the group out in Seattle uh, and are grateful for all of their support and your support as well. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Loneal, for volunteering your time with us and providing us with so much information regarding um, therapies and newer therapies for myeloma. It's now time for the question and answer portion of our program. 
For everyone's benefit, please keep your questions general in nature without many personal details so Dr. O'Neill can provide answers that are general. Operator, can you please give instructions to our telephone and web audiences, please? Thank you. For telephone participants who would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you would like to remove your question from the queue. For participants using speaker equipment, it may be necessary to pick up your handset before pressing the star keys. For web participants, type your question in the Ask a Question box under the speaker video window to submit your question. One moment, please, while we poll for questions. Thank you. And thank you. Dr. Loneal, the first question today is coming from John. John's asking, after treatment reaches remission, as determined by blood draw results, is a bone marrow biopsy the best way to determine the best diagnosis of remission? So, you know, I think that myeloma is one of the diseases where we have an easily accessible biomarker in the blood that can be used to track whether or not a treatment is effective in most patients with myeloma. Uh, and so oftentimes we'll do the SPEP, the serum protein electrophoresis, we'll do the free light chain assay uh, to get a better sense for what else is going on. We may often check a urine protein as well uh, to understand whether that protein is present or absent uh, uh, as another indicator of remission. A bone marrow biopsy is a measure that we use, uh, and in the current approach, we will often do MRD testing on that bone marrow uh, to understand the depth of remission. Uh, and finally, uh, we are now doing imaging to also make sure that uh, we don't see other areas of disease outside of the bone marrow that may not be picked up on routine imaging or routine bone marrow or blood work. Uh, and so a PET scan is another test that we often use if we're trying to understand the extent of a disease control for a given patient. So there are multiple ways that we assess, and at least at our center, we do all of them. Thank you so much. And we'll take the next question from our telephone audience, please. Our question comes from Victor calling from Oregon. Please go ahead with your question. Is there anything on the horizon for patients with a 17P deletion? Yeah, so 17P deletion for the rest of the crowd is a genetic abnormality where you lose the short arm of chromosome 17, which houses a really important gene called P53. And when you're missing P53, um, what you're missing basically is the ability to repair DNA damage in the DNA of a myeloma cell. And if you're a cancer cell, that's exactly what you want to do. You want to remove the ability to repair DNA defects so that you can stay alive and do all the things that myeloma cells like to do. 17P deletion in general tends to be uh, a high risk marker and we at our center treat it with uh, aggressive maintenance. Um, I don't think we have specific treatments targeting 17P. Uh, what I think we all tend to do is make sure that we offer those patients high dose therapy because from our European colleagues, there's good randomized data suggesting they do better with high-dose therapy and transplant. Uh, we tend to recommend doublet or triplet maintenance after transplant. Uh, and then these are patients that we may often refer to bispecific or CAR T-cell therapy a little bit earlier, depending upon uh, their response to salvage therapy uh, to try and get more aggressive treatments in general. But we don't have a way to put that gene back in, at least as of now. And from a, a, from a current perspective, uh, we don't have something that can reactivate that gene in patients who have a mutation or, again, are missing a copy of it. So I think it really is a strategic approach to high-risk myeloma as opposed to something very specific or unique to 17P. Thank you. And you just mentioned doublet or triplet therapy. Are we seeing more therapies be triplet therapies, meaning three medications at once? Yeah, I think triplets certainly in the early relapse setting have become a standard of care. Uh, what, I, what, I, what I was referring to there is maintenance for, with more than just lenalidomide. Um, and so our group has used VRD maintenance for years for high-risk patients. That's triplet maintenance. Uh, I think we've now more recently using KRD 
as maintenance for high-risk patients. Again, triplet maintenance. Uh, the Forte trial from the Italian group used carfilzomib and lenalidomide without the dexamethasone. So that's where the doublet comes in. It's still highly effective therapy in the context of high-risk uh, maintenance therapy. But uh, as you alluded to, most of the time we are using triplets across the board. And even in some cases in newly diagnosed myeloma, we're using four drugs uh, as part of the induction regimen. Thank you. And Ross is also asking, will any treatments not require steroids? You know, um, uh, I don't think I've ever been on a patient webinar or patient meeting where that question didn't come up. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that uh, steroids are highly effective at killing myeloma. Uh, they're also great partners for the IMID class of drugs in the sense that if you look at an IMID alone, the response rate is half what it is when you partner it with steroids. But the benefit of steroids is likely relatively short-lived, meaning maybe four to six months. And so I think that what most of us are doing now is beginning to taper those steroids off earlier, like within a few cycles of treatment, particularly if patients have significant side effects, uh, and even feeling more comfortable with discontinuing the steroids before or around the first year of treatment to try and mitigate some of the side effects that I'm sure our question asker is, is really speaking to. Uh, and so uh, I don't know that we're gonna get away completely from steroids, but I think we're reducing the dose and duration of steroids in a large way to try and make it much more patient friendly. Thank you. And we'll take the next question from the telephone audience, please. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mary, calling from North Carolina. Please state your question. Your line is now live. Yes, my name is Mary Richardson, and I have had all of what you have talked about. And once my my Malone started going up, they they are changing over to another uh, drug, which you Pamela and start with the D. That I start taking those, and I've been on those now for six weeks, and hopefully. They will get my my myeloma back down like it was before when I was on um um what is it um um recommend and uh the other one I can't I can't remember it right now so I've been on it now for six weeks and hoping that things will get better for me so what else and I also take the dextrometra once a week but the palm oil I take every day for for 21 days and then I'm off and then I go back again. What else can I can the doctor do in order to get my mama alone to come down? Yeah, that's a that's a that's a tough question to answer without having a lot of records and things in front of me. Um, again, um, would need to sort of see the treatment history and what drugs have not worked uh, to treat your myeloma and where we are in terms of, um, of the armamentarium that we just described. Uh, but certainly, um, uh, the, I think the good news is that either on clinical trials or with recent approvals, uh, there are a number of agents that hopefully will be a benefit to you uh, if the uh, current treatment, which sounds like palm dara um, uh, is, is not is not helping you. Uh, just, uh, I would ask them to, to look at, again, new approvals and um, uh, work with a myeloma specialist that's near them, near you, uh, to help come up with the next best treatment plan in that context. Yes, and I think this program is, is really proving that there are so many new treatment options that are available to patients right now. Um, so it is a, a very exciting time for, for myeloma treatment. Dr. James is asking, what is the prospect of using these new CAR-T and other novel treatments earlier in the treatment process, perhaps as first-line therapies? Do you anticipate that non-heavily pretreated, newly diagnosed myeloma patients would have better and longer lasting response rates? Yeah, that's a really great question. And uh, you're not the only one asking that question. Um, there have been several randomized phase three trials launched looking at uh, CAR T cell as an alternative to transplant. 
uh, in first remission, looking at CAR T cells as an alternative to salvage therapy in the context of first relapsed myeloma. Uh, we're likely, hopefully gonna see some of this data presented in the next six to 12 months. Um, from many of these trials, looking at the two FDA approved CAR T cells, both Siltacel and Idacel. So I think there's theoretical reasons to believe that the T cell health may be better earlier in the disease and that with better T cell health, you'll get a better product and that it might ultimately result in better outcomes uh, for patients uh, than we see in the relapsed and refractory setting. Those are, I think, really important hypotheses to test. And the only way we're gonna get those answers is from randomized trials and those trials are currently ongoing. Thank you. And I know that you just mentioned transplant. Um, George is asking, what's the difference between autologous and allogeneic transplants? Is it true that an allogeneic transplant um, will be done after failing more than one autologous transplant? Yeah, autologous transplant means you use your own cells. So in that example I showed earlier about the CAR T cell, you take your own T cells out, they get manufactured, and then they're given back to you. Uh, that's sort of the, a similar principle, except there's no manufacturing with an autologous transplant which by far represents the majority of transplants that are done for patients with multiple myeloma. An allo transplant for myeloma means that you take a donor, a healthy donor that is matched uh, to a certain degree with your blood types and with your, um, uh, your HLA uh, uh, types uh, and use that donor to try and bring in um, uh, for, to use that donor to try and bring in a fresh immune system to try and kill out the myeloma. Uh, that is a very high risk procedure in the context of multiple myeloma. Uh, the, the mortality of an auto is less than 1%. The mortality of an allo is significantly higher uh, uh, because of the number of factors, including age, graft versus host disease, and ultimately still relapsed myeloma. Uh, and so, Allos are very rarely performed in 2022 in the US anymore because of all the new, new drugs and treatments that we have that are so effective and don't potentially expose a patient to the risk of death and side effects like graft versus host disease that an allo transplant does expose patients to uh, and is just not done very frequently anymore uh, at this time. Thank you. And we'll take the next question from the telephone audience, please. Our next call is from Ralph from California. Ralph, please state your question. Your line is now live. Hi, I got a technology question, and it's about the robustness of the fish testing. The gentleman that had the 17P deletion, I have a 14Q deletion. But there was some research decades ago in France a, uh, at the Pasteur Institute. A fellow said that uh, there are many substances that uh, during the DNA transcription, leave it unwound. And I wonder if that's actually true, can the fish test actually, are they actually spotting unwound DNA instead of that it's deleted because they're not seeing the coiled? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the beauty of fish testing, unlike routine cytogenetics, is that it doesn't require a... Um, it doesn't require a rapidly dividing cell in order to see it. And so uh, the probes are engineered to look for common uh, binding areas in those genes uh, that don't necessarily have to be wound or unwound in order for it to be seen. There, there may be rare instances where that technically can happen. Uh, what is more likely the case where a fish test may be a false negative is that they don't the, the lab doesn't do plasma cell enrichment. Uh, meaning that you don't just look at myeloma cells, you look at whatever is in the bone marrow. Uh, and if you see a negative result there and the cell and the marrow is diluted out without as many myeloma cells in there, then you may get a false negative in that context as well. Um, you know, 17P, uh, we also often look for P53, not just looking for that whole arm of the chromosome, but certain probes on uh, that, that arm as well. And so I think the modern way of testing fish is a little bit more effective at, at getting around that complication that you described. And thank you for that question. 
Um, the next question comes from Paul, and, and he's asking, do some myeloma patients have minimal side effects that might not be noticed? Uh, well, you know, there's always a spectrum of adverse events and uh, tolerance of adverse events. There are some patients who seem to experience a lot more. There are others who seem to experience a lot less. It doesn't mean that you're having a better or a worse um, response to the drug. It doesn't mean that um, uh, the drug is not working if you don't have side effects. Uh, that was a question that I often get from people who are tolerating their treatment relatively well. Um, you know, I, I think everybody's a little bit different and it's hard to predict where patients are gonna be. But I think if you are experiencing side effects that make it difficult for you to have good quality of life, it's important to explain those and relate those to the team, at least in my team, um, uh, that's something that our nurses and nurse practitioners really focus on a fair amount uh, uh, and try and make sure that it's not just a matter of stay on and you'll, you'll stay on and we're gonna do whatever we have to do. We do wanna make sure we appreciate and understand uh, the, the impact that the treatment is having on your quality of life and your activities of daily living. And if those are significant, we need to make adjustments to make that drug and that treatment more tolerable to allow you to enjoy both the benefit of therapy as well as the benefit of potentially being in remission. Um, so I think there are a number of factors that play into that. Thank you. And we do have a few questions about side effects. Elizabeth is asking, what's the difference between bone pain and muscle pain? Yeah, that's... Um, you know, um, you sort of have to have it to know it. Um, muscle pain is just more achy, uh, whereas bone pain, you can actually feel it in your in the bones. Um, you know, muscle pain uh, tends to like when you uh, when you ran a marathon or you uh, didn't, you, you're not a frequent exerciser and you get up and do more than you can normally do. That experience is more typically muscle pain, uh, whereas bone pain tends to be a little bit more central is a little bit more difficult to manage um, uh, and uh, is more of a dull pain uh, that sort of, um, uh, it, it just qualitatively is a little bit different. Thank you. And Robert is asking, do the medications you use to treat myeloma have any effect on legs like peripheral neuropathy, um, feet being numb, legs being weak, or lower back pain when standing for, for too long of a time? Yeah, they uh, so the probably the biggest offender in this area is bortezomib, also known as Velcade. Uh, Velcade does cause uh, peripheral neuropathy uh, and uh, uh, numbness, both numbness and uh, sometimes tingling, or uh, in 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 uh, extreme cases, electric shock like feeling in the feet uh, or in the hands. Um, I think the goal of um, of being a, a, a uh, an active patient in the management of your disease is that if you're beginning to develop those side effects, make sure you let the infusion nurse know or you let the doctor or nurse practitioner know as well, uh, because those are uh, signs that we need to potentially hold the drug or reduce the dose of the drug or change the schedule of the drug. And in the case of a drug like bortezomib or Velcade, we may go from twice a week to once a week dosing. If you're already at once a week, we may reduce the dose. Uh, and that is a significant issue. It can be seen in other drugs like uh, lenalidomide less commonly, but can be seen. Pomalidomide, it can also be seen, again, less commonly, but it can be seen. And even carfilzomib, in rare set situations, we may see peripheral neuropathy. It's, again, much, much less common, though, uh, than we see it with, uh, with bortezomib. Uh, and um, it can impact your ability to stand for a long time. The low back pain that's being described sounds more like spinal stenosis, than it does like peripheral neuropathy, but certainly peripheral neuropathy can limit the ability of a patient to stand for long periods of time because of pain or discomfort in the soles of their feet. Thank you. And we'll take the next question from the telephone audience. Our next question is from Cheryl from Michigan. Cheryl, please state your question. Your line is now live. Thank you very much. Hi, everybody. I would like to know, um, as there, I'm on Minlaro. I was on Revlimid and I was having, and Balcade, and was having a lot of the neuropathy and some bad side effects. And now on Minlaro, once you take the medication, should you see your, your, um, 
chapel chains and light chains decreasing or do they just uh, stay the same? And I actually had the transplant, the audrinus, I, I don't know, I'm not pronouncing it right. The one that they use your own um, mm-hmm. body to do the transplant. Right, right. And will and will we have a, a, is it a way that we can get information like with all the different meds you listed, um, like a transcript of today's meeting as well? Um, well, certainly, uh, the first question, um, uh, as related to, should you see the light chains continue to drop? Uh, it depends on where they are. And, um, you know, it sounds like the, tr- the treatment was switched from Velcade to Exasimib, uh, because of neuropathy. Um, hopefully that will make the neuropathy better. Exasimib is an oral version of Velcade. It does have slightly less uh, peripheral neuropathy than Velcade and it's oral, so it's a little bit easier to take. Uh, But there can be patients who develop neuropathy with um, exasimib as well. So I think it's worth being very cautious uh, about your symptoms as you continue on the treatment. Uh, There are some patients where uh, they do reach a plateau and stay stable with low level disease without necessarily going down to a normal range. That's okay as long as everything else is okay and you're tolerating the treatment pretty well. Uh, and again, most of the myeloma has gone away. Th- those are sort of judgment calls that your doctor uh, probably worth asking them a little bit more in specific. Uh, in terms of access to the things we're talking about here, I'm going to defer that to our uh, our host here. Yes, we will have a transcript on our website as well as this video recording will be on our website. You can go to www.lls.org forward slash programs, and we will have that for you. So all of the medications, all of the treatments, the slides are actually already up on the program page, but everything will be spelled out for you. Dr. Irwin is asking for smoldering myeloma treatment for um, two to three risk factors. Um, What are the treatment options? Yeah, so for patients that fit into what we now call the high-risk smoldering category based on the 2220 criteria, um, uh, I think that um, there are now two randomized trials demonstrating delays in developing myeloma, either with lenalidomide alone or lenalidomide and dexamethasone together based on the Spanish and the U.S. trial. Now, this is a very controversial area within our field, uh, and actually based on that, um, you know, I think um, uh, I think what I would say is it is really is worth a, a, sig- a significant discussion between you and your doctor, as well as perhaps a myeloma specialist, to determine whether early intervention is a good idea for you. I think it is an important discussion to have, uh, but certainly I would suggest rather than coming off of a cl- doing this off of a clinical trial to try and enroll on a clinical trial, and in fact there is a national trial that almost every center should have access to that is randomizing patients to either Revlimid and Dex versus Revlimid, Dex, and Dertumumab, really trying to understand whether myeloma-like therapy is more effective than prevention-like therapy, which is what we've tested in the past. And that trial is uh, is available across the country uh, and um, uh, I think is really important for us to help answer that question about whether patients benefit from early intervention. Thank you. And Stuart is asking, any progression-free survival or overall survival data for patients um, that have myeloma with AL amyloidosis? Yeah, I mean, I think the amyloid adds in another wrinkle from the perspective of adverse event um, tolerance. Um, But what we know is that if patients can achieve uh, both a hematologic remission as well as a organ remission, uh, that they can do quite well. And I think the Mayo Clinic has data on this. Uh, the group in Boston at uh, BU has pretty significant data on amyloidosis uh, and outcomes. Um, I think what we found is if patients can tolerate the treatment and get into a remission, they can do quite well. I have many patients that are eight, nine, 10 years out from their auto transplant doing uh, uh, back to normal, doing very well with both myeloma and amyloidosis. So I think uh, for certain patients without significant organ damage, uh, it it can be, uh, patients can do quite well. Thank you. And we'll take the next question from the telephone audience, please. 
Our next question comes from Kenneth from Virginia. Kenneth, please state your question. Your line is now live. Okay. Hello. Yes. Hello? Yes. Hi. Yeah. Our question is, uh, is myeloma curable? Is myeloma curable? Yeah, that's a controversial yeah. question. I would argue that there's probably about 10 to 15% of patients who have what we call functional cure, meaning that they are, uh, the myeloma never really comes back and uh, perhaps they end up um, uh, having another cause of death from cardiovascular or other uh, means or ends. Um, uh, uh, but I think uh, for a majority of patients, uh, the myeloma does come back at some point. And the question at that point is not, can we cure it or not? It's, can we put it back into remission? And that really uh, remains a major goal uh, no matter when we see a patient. Thank you for the question. And our next question, um, Taylor's asking, do you find that the timeline for CAR-T manufacturing is accurate? I'm hearing that the length of manufacturing is the biggest barrier to accessing this treatment. Are there long wait times? Yeah, yeah, there are probably two barriers. Uh, the first is the time for manufacturing, which is probably practically within three and five weeks is the average that turnaround that we're getting roughly. Uh, the second is the number of slots for manufacturing that we have. Uh, so I know many large centers have waiting lists of over 50 to 60 percent or 60 patients. Um, and that is not because the manufacturing time is so long. That's because we only get a very limited number of slots per month. Uh, to be able to uh, put patients through the process. Um, and so I think it's a, a combination of both uh, limited manufacturing slots and time for manufacturing that really is the big limitation in access for patients. Thank you. And Sandra is asking also about CAR T cell ther therapy. Um, she's asking, does disease burden impact the CRS or cytokine release syndrome? and neurotoxicity during the treatment? Yeah, there is there is certainly good data suggesting that the, the risk of severe CRS and neurologic toxicity is lower with lower disease burden. Uh, and so I think sometimes you don't have a choice. You, you go whenever you can go, whenever you get the slot, whenever you get what you get. Uh, um, but, um, but I think if you have a choice, going in a situation where the disease is lower or perhaps even a little bit better controlled uh, is, uh, is one way to reduce the adverse events associated uh, with the acute infusion of a CAR T cell. Thank you. And we'll take the next question from the telephone audience, please. Our next question is from Marla from New York. Marla, please state your question. Your line is now live. Thank you. Um, facing a possible CAR-T uh, clinical trial, but uh, I want to know what happens to the other 40% or so that the, the CAR-T may not work. Can you do a second CAR-T, or what are the options after CAR-T? Yeah, um, I mean, I think the response rate is higher than 60%, um, certainly, so uh, it's probably a much smaller number depending upon the product that you get. Um, uh, you know, I think that um, if you're going to retreat with a CAR T cell, uh, that typically means using a different product. Uh, probably the same product is not necessarily going to give you the same uh, mileage or opportunity for a benefit. Uh, I think that there are patients who have not responded or lost their response to a CAR and then responded to a T cell engager or an antibody drug conjugate. Uh, there are also other targets beyond BCMA, like, as I mentioned, GPRC5D, or FCRH5, all of those potentially remain options in the context of clinical trials as well. So there certainly are other options in that setting. Thank you. And we have Pearly asking if you would try these new treatments, so CAR-T by specifics um, on a 76-year-old? Yes, absolutely. Um, age to me is not a reason to say yes or no to any given treatment. Um, I think that um, if the 76-year-old is functional, then I would definitely do it. I've given a CAR T cell to a patient over the age of 80 uh, without any hesitation or reservation. This was a very fit 80-ish uh, year old. Uh, and so um, uh, for both of these options, it's really more about comorbidities and function than it is age. 
Thank you. That's really good to know. We do get questions a lot in regards to a person's age and the type of therapies that they um, would be able to have. So thank you so much. Um, the next question is from Dennis. Dennis is asking if extramedullary plasma cytoma and non-secretory myeloma, are the treatments the same um, as for general myeloma? Um, yeah, you know, um, certainly the extramedullary, particularly at the time of presentation, <laughs> is, um, is, is, uh, is functional high risk. And so you would treat that like you would treat a high risk myeloma patient. In terms of non-secretory or oligosecretory, uh, the treatments are quite similar to what we would do for myeloma. We just uh, observe them differently in that we need more imaging and we probably need more bone marrow biopsies to understand exactly how much disease we're dealing with because the uh, SPAP and the light chain assays don't help us very much in that context. Um, it is important certainly for non-secretory patients who present that way at the time of diagnosis they can do uh, remarkably well for very long durations of, patient, of time. I have several patients that are 10 plus years out from an auto transplant with non-secretory myeloma doing well. Uh, so it doesn't necessarily mean that the myeloma is harder to treat. Uh, that's different from extramedullary, which is probably a little bit more challenging to treat overall. Thank you. And we'll go to the phone for our next question, please. Thank you. Our next question is from John from Florida. John, please state your question. Your line is now live. Yes. Um, good, good afternoon. Um, in the context of a bad um, lambda light chain, uh, there was a reduction of over 95% within four months uh, on the MGDL range down to where the, uh, quote, normal range is 2.6 or below. Uh, do you follow me, doctor? Yes. In that context? Okay. Uh, so yes. There was, within, within four months, there was a reduction of over 95% from a bad 480 um, to a, quote, pretty good range of five to seven, right, never reaching the magic 2.6. Um, basically, the consensus is on a cost-benefit scale, um, that's good enough for now. It's not technically remission, but you're in the five to eight range. You're not 2.6. We've been doing this for months. You've been stuck in that range for six months. You're not getting any lower. And this was on a combo of DARA, Velcade, and DEX, basically. Yes. Um, so I think that there is um, that there are patients who um, uh, who don't necessarily get to the complete remission uh, benchmark. Uh, and if their symptoms are well controlled, they're tolerating the treatment well, and it's a prolonged low-level disease burden, that's okay. One of my longest patients that I call, he's not in complete remission, but he's in a remission, um, never achieved a complete remission, but this is like 14 or 15 years now. Um, and so as long as you can stay that way and you've reversed organ damage, uh, that's okay. I don't know all the specifics of your case, but um, I think um, there are certainly uh, a lot of situations where I too would be happy with, with where that is. Great, thank you. And I, I know that um, you just spoke about complete remission. Um, can you talk a little bit about MRD, minimal residual disease for myeloma patients? Yeah, uh, so MRD um, is really just another level. So. You know, uh, 25 years ago, a, a complete remission by the old SWOG response criteria was a 75% reduction in the protein in the blood. Um, the most recent uh, complete remission definition means absence of the protein in the blood. Uh, now we've got MRD, which is looking at one in 10,000 cells, one in 100,000 cells, or one in a million. So if your MRD is negative at 10 to the minus six, that means there are fewer than one in a million myeloma cells in that sample. If you're one times 10 to the minus five, that means fewer than one in 100,000 cells. Um, and so each of these are just a deeper way to measure how low the tumor burden is. 
but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're cured of myeloma because we know that patients who achieve MRD negativity relapse or can relapse. And so I think that they are important prognostic tools. They're important to tell patients that yes, you've achieved this depth of response, but right now it, we don't have the data that says that if you don't achieve a remission at 10 to the minus six by MRD, that you should change treatment. And that's what many people want to do, but it may be a biologic signal saying that this myeloma is harder to get rid of, or you're not gonna get rid of it, but it's gonna stay where it is. And just cycling through drugs and not seeing them respond may be giving you misinformation. And so what I would tell patients is it's okay to do MRD testing. I'm just not sure I would act on MRD testing right now uh, to make major treatment uh, discontinuation or treatment changes at this time point. I don't think we have the data for that. Thank you. And we'll take the next question from our telephone audience, please. Our next question comes from Victor from Oregon. Victor, please state your question. Your line is now live. Uh, thank you. Yes, I was curious if stem cells that have been collected and frozen have any other potential usage? Uh, for example, can they be used uh, as T cells or uh, for any other treatment other than a transplant? Um, you know, that's a good question. Um, I, there are more modern ways right now to um, take a frozen product and select out the T cells um, so that you could, in theory, do that. I don't think that that's covered under the FDA approvals of either of the CAR-T products currently, uh, but certainly that is one potential way you could do it. The concern would be that the growth factors that you use to mobilize that stem cell product for transplant uh, can have an impact on T cell function. And there is at least a theoretical concern that you may be making them sleepier T cells, if you will, just to be simple, um, than if you just collect them without any growth factors in uh, at all, uh, which is typically what we use now to collect those cells as well. Um, so I think um, you, you can use them for, 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 that, for that purpose. We certainly use T cell, the, those frozen stem cell products uh, many years down the road, if a patient has low blood counts because of chronic treatment and we need to reboost their immune system, uh, or even in the context of um, uh, patients who develop a low blood counts after a CAR T cell infusion, if they're three and six months out and their blood counts have not recovered and their bone marrow looks pretty empty, uh, we've used that, that, that frozen stem cell product in that context as well. So I think there are indications beyond a classic transplant in which those cells can be used. Thank you. And the next question is from Gail. Gail is asking, how does having chronic kidney disease caused by the myeloma affect eligibility for the CAR T cell and other new treatments? Yeah, so you know what we what we know about renal dysfunction or uh, kidney dysfunction uh, really is that the most important thing you need to do is dose adjust the drugs where that's important. Um, and so, for instance, in drugs like lenalidomide, making sure you have dose adjustments for drugs like bortezomib and carfilzomib, we don't have to make dose adjustments for the antibodies. Typically, we don't have to make adjustments. Um, and uh, in the context of transplant. Uh, you just need to use a lower dose of melphalan potentially, but it should not preclude referral to a transplant center. Even a patient that's on dialysis can be transplanted. And in fact, we've gotten patients off dialysis by taking them to transplant and really reducing their amount of light chain burden in the blood uh, to allow that to happen. So I don't think it's that you can or can't get certain therapies. It's really a matter of uh, how to adjust the doses of the medication to make sure that they're being adjusted for some level of kidney dysfunction. Thank you. And we'll take the next question from the telephone audience, please. Our next question comes from Gloria from New York. Gloria, please state your question. Your line is now live. Hi, my husband wants to know, how long does this disease last and does he have to be under treatment for the rest of his life? Um, I think that from the perspective of um, treatment, the current treatment paradigm for most patients is continuous therapy, meaning 
continuous maintenance therapy or uh, continuous therapy, even in the salvage setting, uh, until the drugs no longer work. Now, the caveat to that is uh, tolerance and side effects. If patients have significant side effects, then sometimes treatment can be held or discontinued because of those side effects. Um, we know, for instance, that after CAR T cell, the current FDA label, you give no therapy afterwards. And so that's another way where perhaps people can discontinue treatment. We know that with some of the T cell engagers, for instance, there are patients that have had significant infectious issues early, discontinued, and are now a year or two out, not on the drug, but remain in remission. So I think understanding these newer immune therapies and how long we have to give them, balancing that with the risk of infections is really important. And that is something that many centers are beginning to look at more carefully. Thank you. And our next question is from Lourdes. Lourdes asks, if someone goes into remission, how long will they have to continue on Revlimid? Uh, so in the maintenance setting, um, what, we, uh, what the determination study proved was that longer Revlimid maintenance is better than shorter, which is what the, uh, the French version did. The US gave it continuously. The French only gave it for a year. The remission duration was much longer in the group that got continuous versus shorter duration. Uh, at our center, uh, we've confirmed, uh, we've, we've, we've demonstrated as well in the RVD 1000 series that the longer patients can stay on the better. So I keep patients on for as long as they can tolerate it. And as long as their blood counts are okay, uh, we don't discontinue in that context. Great. And now Lawrence is asking, is there an alternative to Revlimid for maintenance therapy? Well, there is randomized data using exasimib, the oral form of Velcade in maintenance therapy. Uh, the remission doesn't seem to be quite as long as what we saw with Revlimid. Um, there are studies now looking at daratumumab with or without Revlimid uh, as a maintenance strategy as well. Uh, but I think the most data by far is with Revlimid. In the high-risk setting, there's pretty good data for Revlimid with either Velcade or carfilzomib, uh, and I think um, there is some data with the oral form of Velcade, uh, but again, the, the remission duration might not be quite as long. Thank you. And we'll take the next question from our telephone audience. Thank you. Our next question comes from James from Texas. James, your <coughs> line is live. Please state your question. Ah, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, my question is, I'm, if you're uh, one year post-transplant and I'm still experiencing um, Ig issues, uh, nausea and vomiting, um, do you have any recommendations on uh, ways to manage that? Yeah, GI issues um, a year out. Um, don't necessarily fit with the typical toxicity of a transplant. That typically is gone within the first uh, 30 or 60 days. Um, so I think um, it, it warrants more aggressive investigation um, uh, with perhaps an endoscopy and perhaps even a biopsy, uh, as there can be viruses that can sometimes cause nausea and vomiting, like CMV, that are pretty uncommon in the post-transplant setting, but we certainly have seen it uh, and can cause nausea and GI issues. Uh, so I think a more extensive GI workup to better understand that would be uh, would be my next step because it's it's unusual for this to be lingering that long purely from the melphalan. Thank you so much for that question. Our last question today is from Lisa. Lisa's asking, is it okay um, for myeloma patients to take the new bivalent um, COVID vaccine? Yes, absolutely. I think um, we would encourage patients to take the new, the new vaccine uh, as a booster. Um, uh, it's important for patients who are getting uh, daratumumab-based therapies or BCMA-directed therapies to also get some form of antibody protection, as we know that their responses to any of the COVID vaccines is less robust. Our group published that data uh, a little over a year ago now uh, and showed that patients with uh, DARA or BCMA-directed therapies uh, were less likely to mount a significant immune reaction uh, to the vaccines. And so 
in that context, we have recommended the use of EduShield for now. Uh, I'm not sure how helpful EduShield will be with the next wave, but certainly with the last wave of COVID, EduShield did provide some protection uh, in that context. Well, thank you, Lisa, for that question, which is our last question for today. And thank you so much, Dr. Loneal, for your continued dedication to patients and for being able to present this program for us today. Um, we are very happy that you were able to be with us and provide us with this information. Now, if you weren't able to get to um, your question to answer today, you can contact us and speak with an information specialist at 1-800-955-4572. Information specialists are available to speak with you from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Eastern time, or you can reach us by email at lls.org forward slash contact us. Also, patients as well as caregivers can schedule a free personalized nutrition consult with our dietitians at lls.org forward slash consult. And we do offer a variety of education and support resources, including online chats, which are free live forums that are moderated by oncology social workers. And we also offer free education videos and podcasts. We also offer programs to help individuals with blood cancer. So for more information, please contact us at lls.org forward slash finances for information about financial assistance, as well as order our free materials at lls.org forward slash booklets. Please complete the evaluation for today's program at www.lls.org forward slash T-W-E-V-A-L. Again, www.lls.org forward slash TWEVAL or complete the form in your packet and return by Wednesday, November 16th, 2022. You'll be entered to win a gift card. Please note that continuing education credit is not being offered for this program. Again, we'd like to acknowledge and thank Bristol Myers Squibb, Genentech and Biogen, GSK, Janssen Oncology and Legend Biotech, and Cariofarm Therapeutics for their additional support of this program. And thank you, Dr. Loneal, for sharing your knowledge with us today. To all of the patients, caregivers, and professionals participating in today's program, on behalf of the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, thank you for sharing your time with us. Goodbye, and we wish you well. <laughs>